Tonight, my name is Daryl Denard. I serve as the anchor and producer for iHeart Media's urban stations, including V103, WGCI, FM, as well as Inspiration 1390 AM. I'm also the owner of Double D Productions and have a pretty extensive background with regard to broadcast communications. But most importantly, it's my pleasure to be here this evening uh, to try to help in the way of facilitation of you, our most important element, to have an opportunity to talk to the issues that are critical to us and critical to the mission of the task force. And that mission of the Police Accountability Task Force is to lay the foundation for the rejuvenation of trust between the police and the communities they serve by facing hard truths and creating a roadmap for real and lasting transparency, respectful engagement, accountability, and change. We'll hear more about the Police Accountability Task Force as well as an introduction of the members and its chairman in just a few moments. Right now, it's just my distinct pleasure to serve as the welcoming moderator and to tell you just a little bit of housekeeping uh, items. The first is that we'd like at this particular time that everybody silence uh, their cell phones. And we also want to mention that if there's anybody that is in need of services for the hearing impaired, we have interpreters that are available. So if you need somebody to interpret what we're saying, not only here on stage, but also to serve as an interpreter for us, uh, we have that particular service available. And all you have to do is to find any individual that is standing either in the aisles or along the back road there that happens to have a staff badge on. We mentioned before just the mission of the task force. We're going to go in depth in terms of exactly what it is designed to do. And we just want to encourage all of the audience members to share their comments and questions using the comment cards that you were handed as you entered the room. Once again, there is staff strategically placed to take those cards to allow you to have a voice, even if you don't want to verbally express that voice. At this particular time, the staff are around right now, and we want the staff, just so that people have a chance to actually acknowledge you and know where you're placed, that you raise your hands at this time so people in the audience can see how easy it is for you to get your comment to that particular individual. And in terms of acknowledging the dignitaries that are currently in attendance, you can let your hands down. I don't want them to get too tired. Acknowledging the dignitaries that are in, and I'm sure that more will be arriving. And if perchance there was anybody that we failed to acknowledge, we ask for your humble uh, acceptance that we just didn't know that you were here. But we have in the audience former alderman uh, Bob Fioretti. Bob, if you're here. And we also have Senator Patricia Van Pelt from the 5th District. Senator, thank you so much for showing up. And in addition to the dignitaries, we also, even though they are a separate entity from the task force itself, we want to acknowledge the members of the police board that are in attendance at this particular time. And we have three members over to my right, your immediate left, they are Vice President Guillaume Foreman, <laughs> Reverend Michael Eady, and Mr. John H. Simpson. At this time, we want to tell you that the forum's two community hosts are two individuals that we are grateful for them allowing us to come in and to kick off this process of trying to bring accountability with regard to both sides of the ledger, and that is Dr. Johnny Lee, Minnell, Johnny Lee Miller, I should say, Mount Vernon Baptist Church, and Mr. Carl Brinson, president of the NAACP Chicago West Side Branch. We'll hear more from Mr. Brinson later, but right now we would like to also hear from our host, Dr. Johnny Lee Miller. Good evening, everybody. Welcome here at the uh, JLM Center on the west side of Chicago. It is my delight to be the uh, host, and we gladly greet and welcome all of you 
uh, that are here this evening for such a wonderful occasion. We thank God for the task force and for all who have come out uh, to come and voice your concern. We have certainly experienced some brokenness, some problems in our city, and tonight we come to share, we come to bring uh, the opportunity for input from the community. We thank every task force member, we have a board member, and then we thank every uh, marcher, every protester, every worker who has shared a voice to cause us to come together and say, let's talk. For here at the JLM Center, we, we are always encouraged in the midst of a ball game, time out at the free throw line, let's talk about it. And tonight, that's why we have come to talk about and to hold accountability, to voice the concern of the community, and in the midst of the rain, you have come to share, you have come to show your concern, and together we can solve problem. If we're at the table, if we are talking, if we are communicating, we can find some right step to solve some hard problem. Bless you and thank all of you that have come. Uh, all of the facilities are right behind you and there are other members of our staff available to share and assist you for any of your needs on this evening. Welcome. Thank you very much, Reverend Miller. I just want to share some information with regard to the process and protocols that we're going to engage in tonight. We have sorted the comment cards that you have completed into two categories. One category is going to be speakers. These are individuals that are going to have the opportunity to actually either ask questions or pose comments uh, to the task force. And the other is non-speakers. I will probably read those particular comments uh, from the podium here. Speakers are people who would like to make a comment or question from the microphone. Once again, reiterating here that non-speakers are those who choose not to come to the microphone, but instead would like to have their comment or question read. With regard to the process itself, this is how it will work. I will call a person who wants to speak to the microphone while that person is making his or her way to the microphone to save time. I will read a comment from somebody who did not want to speak publicly. I say this because what we're trying to do, even though the audience is rather sparse right now, and we're hoping that they will brave the weather and come to this very important event, we're trying to make sure that we allow everybody everybody that is seated here to have the full opportunity to present those questions, those concerns that are on their mind. Consequently, we ask that everybody is limited to two minutes. We believe that it's more than enough time for you to either pose a question or to you to pose a comment. If you go beyond that two minutes, we're going to unfortunately have to do the Apollo Sandman Sims and pull the hook but we'll do it in a respectful and gracious way. Once again, it's a two minute time limit. Unlike Robert rules of order, you cannot defer your time to somebody else. We're going to avoid talking. And what I'm really saying here is that we're going to be respectful of everybody. So we're going to avoid talking while others are speaking. We're going to avoid making personal attacks and accusations. We will cue you when there's 15 minutes left and we will ask that you return to your seat after your question or comment has been made. Lastly, this meeting is being videotaped and will be available on the Police Accountability Task Force's website. At this particular moment, it is my distinct pleasure right now to introduce to you Ms. Lori E. Lightfoot. She is the chair of the task force who will give an overview of the task force and what it is charged to do. Ms. Lightfoot. Good evening, everyone. Light foot. You can do better than that. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you for breathing this uh, cold and rainy night uh, to come together with us uh, to talk about, I think, issues that are very important and top of mind in many of our communities across Chicago, and that is the question of the relationship between the police department and the communities that is sworn to serve and protect. We uh, very much appreciate. Um, Reverend Johnny Miller uh, for uh, hosting tonight's event and uh, providing us with this uh, forum and opportunity um, to engage 
with members of the public uh, about issues of concern um, in your communities. I also want to thank uh, the West Side NAACP for um, also being a co-host of tonight's event. The primary mission of the task force is to lay the foundation for the rejuvenation of trust between the police and the communities that they serve. We believe that this is a very important moment in the history of our city. Obviously, there have been a number of issues that have come to the fore over the last few months, issues that have really challenged uh, the interconnectedness and the partnership between the Chicago police and the communities that they serve. And why will this moment be any different? I think this will be different because we must find the solution to many of the challenges um, that lay before us. And all of us on the task force are very much committed to those solutions. We are really working very hard as part of our task force work to create a roadmap for real, lasting transparency, respectful engagement, accountability, and change within the police department. We plan to develop a very detailed and comprehensive findings with recommendations that identify areas for change in the short term, the intermediate, and the long term in five important areas. And let me list them for you. De-escalation. We want to make sure that officers who are responding to circumstances where an individual is in emotional distress uh, or exhibiting some mental health issues, that they have the right training, the right judgment, um, in the skills to handle those situations with no or the least amount of force possible. Community and police relations. Uh, I've already talked about that, but really that is a thread that runs through all of the work um, of the task force. Early intervention and personnel concerns. We want to make sure that officers who are having difficulty performing their responsibilities, um, either because they're doing things the wrong way or they need better guidance and training, that we identify those officers at the earliest possible uh, opportunity and put them brought back on the right path or, if necessary, manage them out of the department. And uh, a video release policy. We obviously know, in light of the many videos that have been released over the last couple of months, that the city needs a sensible uh, policy that balances the public's right to know um, about any videos or other information related to things like police-involved shootings with the uh, necessity not to do anything that compromises either an internal investigation or an investigation by law enforcement. So we're working to identify what the right balance is there. And finally, uh, police uh, oversight and accountability, and, and specifically there, we're looking at state law, collective bargaining agreements, general orders, or other policies or practices that would impede the department's ability to be accountable to the citizens that they serve. We have set up working groups, and many of the working group members are in attendance here tonight. These working groups are working on the five areas that I've identified, and we have drawn people from all corners of the city to create a broad and diverse range of people, uh, including many people who have been critical of, this, of the department and folks who have been working on many of these issues for a number of years. They are in turn meeting with organizations and individuals who have important information and perspective to share uh, with members of the working group and ultimately the task force. And again, at the end of that process, we plan to lay out pragmatic, transparent recommendations that every Chicago resident can see and assess. We will not be producing a report that will be nice, we'll have a little press conference, and it will go on a shelf. We intend to lay bare some very tough issues, some very hard truths, things that we haven't talked about in public before and certainly not put down in writing, and then use those as the springboard for the various recommendations that will be uh, coming forth from the working groups. And now I'd like to take a moment to introduce members of the task force uh, who are here and ask them to talk briefly um, about their role and their working group. And I'll start with, um, uh, to my left, uh, Sergio Costa. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Sergio Acosta. I'm a lawyer with the law firm of Hinshaw and Culbertson here in Chicago. I was a federal prosecutor in Chicago for almost 20 years and a state prosecutor in Miami, Florida for five years. Uh, now I do uh, criminal defense work. Uh, the working group that I'm heading up is the working group that's addressing the video release policy. 
Uh, I think it may come as a surprise to some of you here that up until now the city uh, has never had a policy with respect to releasing videos. Uh, we are going to develop uh, recommendations for a policy. We expect to do that ahead of schedule. That is, the task force work is uh, scheduled to be completed by March 31st. We expect to make our recommendation regarding a video release policy much sooner than that. Uh, I welcome your comments here tonight, whether in writing or at the uh, podium. Uh, one of the things that we want to do, in addition to getting uh, comments and thoughts and, and insights from people who are involved in the process, is also to hear from the community. Because one of the things that we're balancing, quite obviously, is the public's right to know. So any insights that you can provide to us uh, from your perspective would be greatly appreciated, and we will certainly take it very seriously into consideration as we develop our policy. So thanks again for coming out. Uh, Victor Dixon. Good evening. I'm the president and CEO of the Safer Foundation here in Chicago. We work with uh, individuals with criminal records to help them secure employment in the private sector and try and break the cycle of poverty as well as recidivism. Uh, certainly, this uh, police accountability work is very important for our clients. Uh, it's very important for me as a native and resident of the city as well. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, the comments. Um, I'm very, very much interested in um, this issue as well as other issues involving uh, ensuring that the people in all parts of our city uh, have, have an opportunity to participate uh, in a positive way in the prosperity that exists here. So thank you so much. Randall Stone. Good evening. Um, before I begin, I should uh, introduce my sister, uh, the Honorable Mary Ann Jackson, who's sitting here in the, in the front. Uh, one of the finest judges in juvenile court here in Cook County. Uh, so I teach at the University of Chicago Law School. I do a criminal and juvenile justice project. And I involve my students in representing uh, children and adults in juvenile court and adult criminal court. And we also work on policy issues related to crime and justice. Uh, I agreed to be on the task force out of a desire to create an environment where the uh, police and the community, are, well, the police are treating the communities all around the city with the same level of dis dignity and respect. Uh, that was the reason that I got on the, on the task force. Uh, we have a working group devoted to community police relations, which, as you can imagine, is a, there's a lot of overlap. And we need as much input as we can get from the community about ways in which we can create that environment that I talked about earlier and submit some practical recommendations to accomplish that result. So I'm looking forward to hearing from the community and working with you and getting some guidance on the issues that are so important to us. I'm going to invite uh, Chicago's own Governor uh, Patrick, if you'd like to join us on the stage. Uh, OK, Governor De uh, Deval Patrick is here. He's been a senior advisor um, to the task force literally from day one, um, has offered us the benefit of his experience. Um, governor Patrick is the former governor of, of Massachusetts, and he also served as the as U.S. Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Division um, of the Justice Department during the Clinton administration years. Um, he's been invaluable to us, and we welcome him home to Chicago. <laughs> and last but not least, Joe Ferguson, uh, who probably needs no introduction, but Joe. Uh, thanks, Lori. Um, I am the Inspector General for the City of Chicago. Um, I've been in that position for six years. Before that, I worked for the U.S. Attorney's Office for 15 years, and I'm also um, a lecturer at Loyola University of School of Law on issues of national security and civil rights. Um, I am a um, uh, more of a technical advisor to the task force overall, um, and um, my office is assisting with the provision of research and various resources to inform the work of the task force overall, and I would encourage everybody to go to the website, um, chicagopatf.org, 
where you'll not only see what it is that we are moving into, but you will find it um, as we go forward to be um, a phenomenal resource on all of the issues that we'll be dealing with. Um, and uh, I am additionally um, uh, a member of the working group that is specifically assigned to look at police oversight and accountability. Um, there are a lot of good things that are done in Chicago, a lot of good things that are done by the Chicago Police Department, and the issue is what happens when things go off the rails. And all of uh, the recommendations and findings um, that will come forward um, from the work of all of us here with all of the wonderful people on our working groups um, really won't amount to much if the overall structure of uh, oversight doesn't provide for um, true rigor um, and integrity in the implementation of all of these things, and that's, that's the overall um, uh, examination of our accountability structure. Thank you. <clears throat> Before I turn it back over to uh, our moderator for tonight, I do want to emphasize a couple points. We really are at an incredibly critical moment in the history of our city, and all of us have a role to play in improving the quality of delivery of the service with, uh, from the police department. There are neighborhoods in our city that are, are under siege. There's crime that's raging. And we need the police department to be successful in those neighborhoods. But what we measure success by is not the number of arrests, the number of stats, but the success is truly engaging the community in a partnership. And that's what we're uh, interested in hearing from you about tonight. Ways in which you can offer up from your own experience, the experience of your neighbors, stories, um, about your experience with policing in Chicago and any specific solutions or guidance that you can provide to members of the task force, we want to hear from you. We believe that this is a, a t an opportunity for all of us to come together and speak in one voice about the direction and the path forward. We have to have the police, but we need them to be able to do their jobs in a way that is respectful to the Constitution, the laws that they were sworn to uphold, and more importantly, uh, recognizing the humanity of the people in the neighborhoods that they are sworn to serve and protect. So again, we want to thank you all for being here, and we'll get started with uh, questions and comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Lightfoot. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to ask that everyone limit their question or comments to two minutes. Uh, when there is 15 seconds remaining, I will give you a very slight verbal cue to let you know it's time to wrap up. Uh, we're going to alternate between those that are going to speak at the podium and those that have provided written comments or questions. We're going to start with Mr. Carl Brinson from the NAACP Westside Branch. Thank you, Mr. Brinson. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. The NWSP has a long-standing history of fighting for equal equality and accountability for all people, especially people of color, against institutions that have a history and pattern of violating people of color human rights. We are seeking reform in three, in, with three institutions today related to the Polish Department. The first institution, is the Department of the Independent Police Review Authority, better known as EMPRA. The Office of Professional Standards, OPS, dealt with residents' complaints regarding police misconduct during the community mistrust an ordinance created, approved, and passed in 2007 by the City Council, promoted a civilian-run entity separated from the Chicago Police Department, Chicago Police Department, better known as CPD. This, this entity was emperor. However, we have found that emperor is not independent and has no authority to actually enforce disciplinary actions. It, cannot, it can only recommend to CPD about what should happen to an officer. The police board makes a final determination on shootings and any disputes between CPD and emperor. One minute of a subject so important. Sorry. It's just that we are limiting everybody's comments to two minutes, sir. Currently, emperor is required only 
to only investigate CBD misconduct issues that deal with the following. Allegations of the use of excessive force. Police shootings where an officer discharged his or her weapon and strikes someone. Death, by, death in custody, domestic violence, verbal abuse, including bias and coercion. Allegations of off-duty misconduct regarding to excessive force and weapons discharge incidents. We are, working, we are working on a community input model of how emperors should function and, be, and become truly independent from the police department. One of our members, Second Vice President Renell Terry, will give more information about emperor and some solutions. Second institution, CPT, Chicago Police Department, better known as CPD. In, institutional racism is an undercurrent of many of the problems in the department because racism is so hard to uncover especially through empirical studies. We want to take this opportunity to state that professionals are needed to study this issue to determine exactly where racism, li where racism lies in this department. After the seconds. problem has been clearly identified, we can begin to create solutions that would likely settle community unrest and distrust. Here are some points we have noticed regarding race in the department. The culture of the department pressures minority officers to use excessive force to prove they are on the right side. One, officers rarely serve in their own neighborhoods with some of the more violent officers choosing to be assigned to diverse and underserved black and brown neighborhoods. History has shown us that in our communities, these actions are less likely to be penalized. Rebecca Raines, our criminal justice department chair, will speak more to that. Thank you very much. Finally, Mr. Finally, you know what? Could I say this, sir? Could I say this? Because I don't want it to be mistaken that we're trying to afford anybody extra time. What we can tell you is that if you have any prepared remarks, and this applies to everyone, you can submit those prepared remarks to us, and we'll make sure that they will get posted and will be reviewed by every member of the accountability task force. So. We're doing this in an effort to be fair to everyone, sir. So if you have prepared remarks, we ask that you just give those remarks because right now you actually went over the two minute time limit that we're trying to make sure that we adhere to so that everybody has an opportunity to voice their concerns. Okay? Thank you very much, appreciate it. You can submit that in writing, sir. You can submit that in writing. You can submit that in writing. I'm not taking up your time. You've already passed your time. Those are the rules that I've been handed, sir. But if you're okay with them, and if I already afforded you more than two minutes, what, what's the problem? It's not my rules. I'm going by what the task force came up with. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. And turn my night back on. Thank you. And finally, for the final institution that we need to have reform in, is FOP, which is the Fraternal Order of Police contract. FOP is like many unions striving to protect its members from unjust labor practices. The FOP, unlike other unions, also strive to protect its members prohibited obvious criminal behavior by doing nothing in its power to ensure that criminal members never suffer any penalties that other citizens that other people accused of criminal behavior would experience. This is a, this is a proven in, in, the, in, in the FOP contract that proves by the city, by, by approved, approved by the city corporate council and the city council. Some examples of the laws that, that evades policies are police that allow I mean, policies that allow the, the accused to be review, to review his or her statements before any additional questions in an effort to assure his or her has the initial report story straight. Policies that do not allow emperor investigators, investigators to interview the shooting, the shooting officers during the first Mr. 24 Brinson? hours of the Mr. shooting. Brinson, Alleged allegation reasons is not so line. that shooters office has an opportunity to deal with the trauma of his or her actions. Meanwhile, citizens must Mr. Brinson, thank you for your thank time. Thank you, sir. We have, to, we have to get on and give other people an opportunity.
Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. I appreciate you, Mr. Brinson. Any comments there, Chairman Lightfoot? Would anybody like to chat? I think we need to, let's, let's let other people speak. Okay. We thank you very much. As I mentioned, in terms of the procedure that we're going to follow, we're going to have one speaker, and then we're also now going to read a comment, uh, and that is going to be from Miriam. How many officers are assigned to a sector? How many officers are assigned to a beat, specifically beat 921? What happened to the DARE program? Why do volunteers and retired cops organize the CAPS meetings? The 9th District Office is far from my neighborhood with this issue, how does CPD take responsibilities with public announcements? Why do I have to make a phone tree to get a quick response? They had you here as a non-speaker. Go ahead. Do you want to, do you want to speak? I'll just go ahead and ask you the question. These are just answers. So why, don't, why don't you, ma'am, why don't you tell us your name? Okay, so my name is Miriam Yvette Perez. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. I lived in um, Brighton Park 15 years, part of the 9th District, and these are just questions that I have called 311, but I never got an answer to. So the first question is, how many officers are assigned to a sector? How many officers are assigned to a beat? Um, what is the progress and what happened to the D.A.R.E. program for CPS? Why do volunteers and retired cops organize the CAP meetings? C, well, CAP, and the 9th District Office is far from my neighborhood. I live on Sacramento and 40th, and the 9th District Office is on 35th and Halstead. And I usually call 311 to, for posters, for like cat meetings and anything that's going on, and they usually tell me to go to the office. I want to know what like responsibility for CPD with public announcements. And my other question is, is it true that the only juvenile justice detention center is the one on California and Pershing in all Chicago? And for situations, well, robbery solutions. I usually go to the CAP meetings and they usually don't have any solutions for me. So I would like to know some public announcement solutions for that. L let me pick up on your, your last point. You've asked a, a number of great questions. Um, the CAPS program is one of the things that we're specifically looking at. Um, as many of you may know, um, Chicago created uh, the model uh, for community policing that we now know as CAP. Um, and that, that program became a model for the nation. We know that currently we're far away from where we need to be um, on community policing, and that's one of the specific things um, that we're going to be addressing, um, in particular through uh, the community engagement uh, working group. You have a, a number of specific questions. I think we've got your um, contact information. We'll make sure that you get an answer to those specific questions, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Can Mr. J. Williams come forward? Mr. Williams, your comment or question? Is Mr. Williams still in attendance? Okay, well, we're going to move on. Actually, can we also hear Reverend Floyd James then? Mr. Floyd James? Good evening. Good evening, sir. I'm Pastor Floyd James, pastor of Greater Rock Baptist Church, located here in North, in North Lawndale. My concerns were, many of you brought up some points. Uh, our community as a whole looks at the police department based on the observation and the things that have happened in our community from a negative perspective. And as a result, we're trying to change that perspective. One of the things that we need to do is have programs where there's more sensitivity training for our police department. We've talked about that over the years, but somehow that's not getting across. Uh, the treatment, I heard someone else earlier talk about, we wanted fair and equal treatment to other communities throughout our city. And too many times uh, police enter this community and uh, other communities that are similar to ours, where we have impoverished and poor, and the treatment of the community residents is less than it should be accorded to them. Uh, we want equal treatment, and we believe that the police department need to have continued education treatment each year continually, not just one time, but continually do that so that they'll be understanding of what they need to do and how they need to react and act in certain cases. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, we need to have uh, programs for our young people uh, 
to be able to interact positively with the police because most of them have had negative interaction with the police department. And subsequently, they carry those negative interactions uh, with them when they're uh, stopped by the police or are detained by the police because the youth of today are not like the youth of yesterday was. Um, as a result, uh, we need to be able to deal with that deal effectively with that and we also need to let the uh, police also have training seconds. with regards to that and I believe that those are some of the areas that we need to look at and uh, be cognizant of thank you so much thank you sir thank you for your comments sir right now we're going to read a question from mr. Williams and that is what is the position of the task force on the police being better equipped to defuse incidents involving citizens having a mental health crisis or episode well, as I mentioned in um, our opening statements, uh, one of the issues that uh, we have a specific working group on is uh, de-escalation. And that's specifically one of the issues that we're looking at is the police um, engagement with folks who are um, suffering some, some kind of emotional crisis uh, or have mental health issues. We need to make sure that when people call 311 that the uh, OEMC call takers and dispatchers ask the right questions uh, to identify those specific circumstances. Uh, we clearly need to look at expanding uh, the n number of officers who are trained in crisis intervention uh, techniques, and that when those officers um, get dispatched to a call, that they rely upon their training, their, their um, judgment, and frankly, their common sense to work to diffuse situations um, as, as best they possibly can without having to use any force. Um, there are a number of um, cities across the country who are experimenting with different models um, in, in for, uh, for, exam uh, for example, Oakland involves mental health counselors with the police um, and they actually ride along and, and arrive at the scene and are they, they're, they're the first line of defense, if you will, in handling those kind of circumstances. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for us um, to look at what the training is now, how it can be improved and draw upon examples from across the country. And that's something that we're specifically looking at as part of the task force. Thank you very much. Mr. David O'Banion, can you step forward to the podium, please? <coughs> Hello, my name is David O'Banion. I'm not used to speaking in front of crowds, but I have a suggestion for curbing this um, killing of our kids by the police officers that are unarmed is they're talking about getting rid of Rahm Emanuel, getting rid of Anita Alvarez, getting rid of McCarthy. I think well, one of my suggestions is if we would just see to it that Jason Van Dyke went to jail for what he's done, the rest of the officers don't want to go to jail and that would curb the officers from killing our babies. If we would just see to it, not let them shift it and and, and send the court, have them try this court somewhere else or change the venue, try it wherever they're gonna try it and have some blacks on the jury and see to it that Jason Van Dyke goes to jail. If Jason Van Dyke went to jail, that would, sh that, that would scare some of these policemen from just gunning our innocent grandkids down. Thank you very much. You. I'd like for I'd like at this particular time if Ms. Pamela Hunt can come to the podium, and as she comes, I want to read a comment from Mr. Terry, and that is IPRA and solutions to help make them independent and police accountable. The question there is she's trying to get a comment with regard to IPRA and solutions to help make them truly independent and police accountability. I'll, I'll take that up. Yeah. Um, there are... A, we're aware that IPRA has actually been looked to as a model for the type of legislative structure um, for an organization of its type. And every major city has an organization specifically assigned to that responsibility. The question is, is out there, many questions are out there, are whether or not IPRA actually is independent. And so the sorts of things that we would want to look at and that we will be looking at and are looking at is, um, are they truly structurally separate? Is there act, do they have complete access to information that's separate and apart from the police department itself? Do they have access to all information? Do they have the capacity to actually 
um, uh, pursue um, their uh, uh, investigations and recommendations without any form of influence. Some of that goes to the issues of how they're staffed. Are they staffed excessively with people who come from the police department? How are they trained? Are they trained to the level of law enforcement officers at a, at, that, that is specified at a statewide level? All of these both go to um, structural things and go to culture of the organization as well that all point to the degree of independence and uh, those are all on the table. Thank you very much. Ms. Hunt? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. You're very welcome. I really wish we had a larger turnout because I know many residents on this west side uh, have been victims of police brutality and continue to do so. Uh, my point, uh, I'm going to put it where the goats can get it. Um, at the heart of this is racism and racist officers and their behavior. I don't see anywhere in your working group that you have psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, people who have credibility in dealing with racism to identify the current racist officers on the force and then also to prevent racist officers from entering the force. And when I say racist, I'm talking about white racism. Now let me address the issue of black officers who commit police brutality. We all know that sometimes you do observe the behavior and absorb the behavior of your oppressor. And we know that many of these officers are doing just that. We talk about fair and equitable treatment in communities. As a black person, I can be on the north side of Chicago and get the same treatment as I would on the west side. So if you are not sincerely and wholeheartedly dealing with racism, you are not going to get to the bottom of this issue. It is systemic in the police force and the legal system. I stand here as a person who has been helped by the police officers and want to be able to trust them when I call them, but I've also been a victim of police brutality in front of a CAPS meeting. 30 seconds. And had a witness from the CAPS meeting to come and testify in court on my behalf but the case was unfounded. So I'm asking you to please deal with the root of this. And you need another task force that's talking about racism and racist behavior. How are you going to train someone who comes de-escalated, I mean comes escalated to a situation? Judgment Thank you. and training goes out the window when you talk about racism. Thank you so very much. Comment. Thank you for thank you for the, your remarks. Um, I think, as part of our working group, community relations, we will be looking precisely at that issue. Uh, we think that issues of systemic racism, unconscious bias, and conscious bias are all a part of the problem, and need to be addressed both in terms of training, uh, recognizing it when it occurs acknowledging it and dealing with it. One of the uh, experts that we will probably be reaching out to is uh, uh, somebody, uh, Dr. Philip Goff, who has done a lot of research on policing and, and bias, and in fact, is doing some training at some police departments around the country on that very issue. So I agree with you. I think your comment was right on point, and I think many of us on the, ta on the task force will be looking at that issue. Thank you so very much. Yeah, um, thank you for your comments. I think the other thing the task force can do is uh, really um, identify and, and, and put forward some of the data that would support the fact that there is uh, a bias in terms of how the police department functions. And uh, there's a lot of data and there's a lot of analysis that shows that very fact. So it's not just simply anecdotal. There's uh, real data that supports some of those issues as well. At this particular time, we ask that Ramel Terry come to the podium, and as she comes, I'm going to read another question. We know now that there is racism. Why not make the majority of police in black neighborhoods black instead of training them to deal with blacks?
Anybody want to comment on that? Well, I think clearly race permeates a, lo a number of these issues. And my colleagues, I think, have addressed your point. Many of the points that you raised are points that we've talked about. Uh, there are issues that we're, we will be wrestling with. Um, we need to think about the fact that we live in a very segregated city and we're drawing uh, police officers from neighborhoods where they may not have grown up with anybody who looks different from them, black, white, brown, or Asian. Yet we bring them together in this police department and we ask them to work cooperatively and go out and deal with citizens that they may have no understanding about. So one of the things I think that we will be looking at is what kind of tr specific training do officers get to deal with that difference, to deal with and equip them uh, to go into neighborhoods where they may be completely unfamiliar with uh, the, the lifestyle, the, the people, um, and it can't just be statistics, the crime statistics, it's got to be more. Um, and we know anecdotally that that happens. Young officers find somebody who's more seasoned, a training officer or somebody who's been on the job, and they kind of give them the lay of the land. But we want to make sure that that's done as a matter of course and not as an exception. And clearly, getting at the issues related to race um, are a critical part of what we've got to look at. And I think, frankly, what the department's got to look at going forward to make sure that its officers can serve in any neighborhood, no matter what the circumstances are. One, one more point to add to that, which is that the police department needs to be more aggressive in terms of its recruiting in minority areas of the city. And that's one of the issues also that we're looking at. Ms. Terry, I'm sorry. I, I'll just add to that last point. Um, many of you know that the city's been engaged in a recruitment process um, that just ended on the 31st um, to go out and bring new recruits um, into the department. My understanding is the numbers um, of uh, minority applicants are at historic highs. So I think we're taking some steps in the right direction, but clearly there's more work to be done. If I could add very of quickly, course, go ahead. Um, and I want to work off something that, that Pastor James raised a little bit earlier in his remarks, programs for youth to foster positive interaction. If um, our youth does not have positive interaction with the police in the streets, they are not positively disposed towards becoming police officers. So it's a very important point. It ties to community relations. And when we're talking about racism generally, um, uh, what we're talking about is the more pernicious and sometimes hidden aspects of professionalism. And what we can do is make sure that we have a system that holds officers accountable for professional behavior in all respects to at least make sure while we struggle as a society with the greater issues of racism that lay within, that everyone is treating each other in a professional and civil way. Ms. Terry. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ramil Terry, and I'm representing the Chicago West Side NAACP. I serve as the second vice president. And the following is a direct statement from the IPRA ordinance. Pursuant to the Municipal Code of Chicago, Chapter 2-57, the Independent Police Review Authority, through its chief administrator, recommends discipline and sustained cases to the superintendent of the Chicago Police Department. It should be noted that IPRA disciplinary recommendations are subject to non-concurrence by the superintendent of police or a hearing by the Chicago Police Board, either of which may result in a final disposition different from the IPRA recommendation contained in the posted investigative abstract. The final determination of discipline is made by the superintendent of pol police or the police board. So where's the independence in that? So what we need from the Police Accountability Task Force, City Council, and the Mayor's Office to make IPRA independent and the police accountable? Expand the IPRA authority to determine if the officer committed a crime. Institute referral power for special prosecution. Implement immediate toxicology testing for police involved in shootings. Remove the po Chicago police review process. Expand the complaint intake to include all cases that include an officer and a civilian or an officer's family member. And it totally needs to be restructured. And this can simply be done through city council making sure to amend the current ordinance. Because we've created a flow chart at the Chicago Westside NAACP and we also have copies that show 
IFRA is not truly independent. In order to make a decision, it always goes back to the police. So essentially, we have the police policing themselves. And on no job can you do that. I cannot have complaints against myself, and then I can have my colleague to say whether or not I did the right or wrong thing. If I committed a crime at work, I would lose my job, and then I'm going to court to face that crime. Therefore, if you guys are serious about helping us, we need for you to truly work with city council to make IPRA Thank truly you. independent. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Ms. Terry. Right now we ask that Mr. Gil Walker come to the podium. As he comes, here's another comment. Trust and respect will only be given when it is received. My son made an incorrect turn on a red light in Hyde Park and four police cars surrounded him. Upon leaving his car, he had insurance and in full compliance. He was allowed to leave. He was also slammed onto a car and harassed, but never given a reason for being stopped on another occasion as well. He has since decided to leave Chicago for fear of crime and police. Just a comment there, if anybody wanted to talk. Let's let the gentleman speak. Mr. Gill? Hey, Gil, how's it going, man? I'm good, Daryl. Good. I am Gil Walker, former director of resident programs for the Chicago Housing Authority, former uh, athletic director, basketball coach, Olive Harvard College, former executive director, YMCA, former national chairman of the Chicago Inner City Games, former, I've done everything. I'm an expert when we deal with the youth-oriented programs. I want to commend this Police Accountability Task Force as well as the police board to look ahead, to have some vision. However, you got to take a step back and look at the programs that worked that worked. Young men between the ages of 17 to 26 are crying out for discipline. They really truly need it, but we need to foster some programs that do that. I'm staying in my lane. I can't do nothing about the police brutality. I can't do nothing about education. I can't get, get you a job, but I can do something about the character in you. Stop putting money in programs that's not developing that. Ralph Waldo Emerson said his best. Everyone's greatest one in life is for someone to tell them what to do. We can no longer advocate our responsibilities as adults and do that. So what I'm asking you to do, just do a little research. Google me. There's programs that actually work. Stop giving money to programs that don't. The park districts are empty. One minute. I'm through. Y'all know where to find me. Let's do what we got to do. All right. Yes, that's Gil Walker. At this particular time, we ask that Senator Patricia Van Pelt come to the podium. And as she comes, I'm going to read another comment or question. Why are certain homes that are identified as drug houses rated and the drug activity starts back upon the drug dealer's release? Target the problem. Residents should be flagged and some sort of resolution to break up the drug dealing should take place. The home on my block has been rated 10 plus times, and the drug violence continues. Senator. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm State Senator Patricia Van Pelt from the 5th District. This is the district, I'm, this is the 5th District that we're standing in. And first of all, I want to thank you all uh, from the police board and also for the, from the accountability task force for coming together and going around the city to listen to the um, ideas and visions of the residents. Um, you know, I wanted to wait for a while to hear what some of the residents had to say before I spoke. I have introduced several pieces of legislation to help with police accountability. One is to be sure that the records of misconduct, police misconduct, are not destroyed. And right now, and right now, they can be destroyed with a two weeks notice. We really need this police board, the IPRA, the city, somebody to appeal the arbitrators decision. We've had two arbitrators that said destroy the records. And we cannot uh, look at patterns of behavior with those records destroyed. Uh, number two is to be sure that they are, we're able to get access to the videos. And I heard someone saying that they were working on that, yes. so I won't cover that because you, I know you're working on it. We want to be able to get access to those videos in a more timely manner. But la lastly, um, I just want to say the vast, vast majority of police officers are good officers. And the ones that are bad just happen to be really bad. So my last bill that I introduced is to create an independent civilian review board, 
similar to IPRA, but they will be appointed by groups that are uh, accountable to the community, like NAACP, the American Civil Liberties Unity, Union, uh, Community Renewal so Society, and groups like that, and United Congress of Community and Religious Organizations, along with the public defender, the state's attorney, the uh, you know, uh, IG. I believe that if we get people like that on a review board, we can get a different result. And lastly, with my last few seconds, um, I'm hoping that we can make changes in that union contract with those clauses that say that we cannot really investigate officers when they shoot people. I believe if they kill people, they should be treated just like everyone else. Thank you. We would like for Mr. D. Halobe to come to the podium. As he comes, I'm going to read another question and comment. My father was witness to two police beating up two young men who were mistaken for burglars. This was obviously a mistake, but the police kept beating. My father took pictures. He was soon arrested. One guy had his arm broken. He was left in handcuffs all day. Nothing was done about or to these officers. That is a comment there from Anonymous. Well, let, let me just say with respect to that, um, that obviously sounds like a very serious situation. I, I appreciate that the person doesn't want to come forward, but I urge you um, to, we have staff all around the room, um, we can get a complaint filed and get that, the, the investigation open right away. Um, we should not have a situation where something as serious as that happens and there's no investigation. So please, whoever wrote that comment, you didn't put your name down, let's make sure that justice is followed. Mr. Dihalobe. Yes, um, I'm uh, Dihalobe Lumumba. I'm a former gang member. Uh, I have a number of a coalition now, we call it Street Peace Coalition. We deal with uh, violence intervention. And uh, one of the things I wanted to say was that will these police that make these false reports and these incidents uh, Will they be held accountable? And, and another thing that I want y'all to know, I want the media to know, and I want everybody else to know, a lot of this so-called violence in our community, a lot of it is orchestrated by the police, all right? That happens when I was gang banged. They used to bring us from one neighborhood to another, and we used to get beat up, or we beat up whoever they bring up in our neighborhood. So, you know, a lot of the violence that we speak about is orchestrated, it's created. And not only that, but they go around and they shoot people in the, at night, and they blame it on gang bangers. So we need to have something to deal with those type of issues as well, all right? Because we're not going to keep accepting being brutalized, gunned down, and killed by the police. We're going to have to stand up. I'm talking about the black men that are capable and ready and willing. We're going to have to stand up and defend our community. Now, I'm a, I'm a bogusly, a wrongfully convicted felon, so I can't have a weapon. But you can rest assured that if it was any way legally possible for me to have it, I would have it, okay, for the defense for black people because we've been subjected to all type of brutality, racism, and all type of garbage, and it's just being accepted not only by our community, but it's being accepted by those who are responsible for the community. I'm talking about you elected officials as well. They're quiet on these issues. We're being shot all over the country. We're being brutalized all over the country, and ain't nobody saying nothing. So um, that's my comment. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you, sir. I would like for Ms. Cassandra Brown to come forward to the podium. As she comes, I'm going to read another comment. Why aren't policemen monitored like everyone else? They should be graded once a year for their performance. That's a comment. I don't know if that is a particular process that's followed, but it's a concern of somebody. Ms. Wilson? Good evening, ma'am. Ms. Brown, I'm sorry, Cassandra Brown. Hi, my name is Cassandra Brown. And um, I'm standing here because uh, I, uh, I went through an incident in 2009 with the police. I was uh, brutalized by the police. Uh, I was taken from my home that I was staying with my aunt, caring for my aunt. They came into her house without me opening the door. I don't know how well I found out later that they had a key that the young lady who pressed, um, had uh, came up with some false charges against me uh, came in and, and let themselves in. I'm kind of nervous, so you got to uh, Take bear your time. with me. But um, 
My question is, this is uh, 2016, and Emperor hasn't done anything about what happened to me. I want to know what, um, how, I mean, yeah, it's a long time. Um, why does it take them so long to uh, correct the wrong that, that, that was done to a citizen as myself? I mean, for one, they came into the home illegally. They did not read me my rights. They handcuffed me. They put me into a cruiser. They didn't restrain me. This officer was speeding to get me to the police station. Uh, went through stop signs, red lights, and came to one stop sign on Michigan, because I was out south at the, at the time, I was living out south, and slammed on his brakes, throwing me into the bars. I injured myself. I, t I had torn ligaments in my arm. I begged and asked repeatedly to go to the hospital to see a doctor, even to have them bring a doctor there to look at me. I was not helped. No one did anything. When they let me out the next day, I still asked, they told me I had to leave the station. I had to walk to the hospital in pain. When I got to the hospital, I was seen by a doctor. They did x-rays, they did everything. They told me my injuries, put me in a sling, gave me some uh, medication. I have a $7,000 hospital bill because of that incident, okay? The, the officer who detained me because he did not arrest me because he didn't read me my rights. He detained me. Um, 30 seconds. Okay. Was the lady who was the lady's daughter's boyfriend. So it was a revenge action that that, that was permitted, uh, uh, committed against me. And that was wrong. And so my, my question is how are we going to be able to trust our officers when they take matters take the justice and, justice and use it to their uh, advantage, you know, to, to their, yeah, to do what they want to do to citizens, you know, at, at will. Thank you, Mrs. Brown. Yeah, Ma'am, thank you for your comments. Um, I'm going to point to Jennifer. Make sure, can you please make sure you get her contact information so we can get an answer uh, from MIPRA on why, where, what the status of your case is. If you could give it to the young the lady there. We'll make sure that we get you an answer. And thank you very much. I ask that Malcolm Crawford come to the podium at this time. Question from people in the audience. Why does Chicago top big cities in fatal police shootings? Why are black people killed disproportionately? Why are there tons of complaints, but police rarely get in trouble? Why are white people more likely to have their complaints validated? And finally, why are city investigators aren't there to help and why does the city have a major stop and frisk problem? These are questions and concerns that were that that's talked that's ex about by one of our attendees. Those questions are exactly why we're here. And um, behind it all is the question of the accountability of the accountability system <coughs> itself. Um, and. Um, there are lots of good ideas. There are lots of terrific models that are being implemented around the country. There are actually good policies and aspects of good programs within our existing system that aren't being implemented with rigor and with full integrity, and that's part of what we're looking into. Thank you very much. Mr. Crawford. Hello, my name is Malcolm Crawford, and I'm the evening, director sir of evening, Austin's sir. African American Business Network and Association. Uh, a couple of things, uh, being in the city all of my life, things have, looks like it's moving in the right direction compared to how they have been. Um, a couple of things that I would just like to, uh, for you guys to look at is, as a young man, one of the things that helped to stir me in the right direction was the uh, Police Explorer Program. I think that's a program that's underutilized by the city and it kind of made us think and act a little bit different uh, when we were wearing the uniform and we were, uh, you know, leaving our community to go to the police station and do different things at the police station. So I think that you guys should really look at the uh, Police Explore program. Uh, a couple of other things is that uh, the 15th district needs a, a, a black police sergeant over there. There's nobody over the 25th district. And so uh, they're getting a higher up a lieutenant 
but they have nobody who's driving around. Most of everybody who gets stopped in the 25th district is black, but there's not one person driving around uh, who looks like us in the 25th district. So I think that that's something that should be done uh, automatically that we have a, at least one black sergeant in an area where everybody who's being stopped is black. So I think that's something that can be done right away. Another thing, another thing seconds. is, I got you. Another thing, another thing is, uh, the community that we come from, that I come from in Austin, most of the police officers, when they turn the siren on, they turn them on on Harlem. And they have to drive from Harlem in Oak Park all the way to the city because they're having lunch in Oak Park. So maybe we need to try to find a way to keep the officers in the community for a little while so that when something happens, they can be there closer than turning the lights on on Harlem and coming to the city. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'd like for Ms. Evangel to come to the podium. As she comes, I'm going to read another comment, this time from Mr. Thomas Woe. How will this task force measure the police training program for the police department? What effective training method will be used to reduce the number of black people killed on the street? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, ma'am. My name is Evangel Yanubian. Before we reestablish trust, we need respect for Jim Crow genocide survivors and their descendants for the first time. I'm 70 years old, and I don't ever remember an officer friendly. I used to carry a, put a sign in my window that says, we call police. Today my sign reads, we don't call police. They are soldiers enforcing the shoot to kill order of 1968 and the Dred Scott decision of 1857 that says blacks have no rights. I call the FOI, the feud of Islam, and I want to know why can't we have uh, private police like they have in uh, the University of Chicago when they have those private police officers driving around protecting that community. Uh, in November of 2015, ex-police officer Ed Burke, alderman in the ward where Latron, uh, Laquan McDonald was murdered, sponsored a, res a resolution making the military a protected class of persons, and it passed. Since the officers that killed a woman on, by accident and shot a 19-year-old four times in the back uh, out uh, on purpose because of his fear, uh, and now he's uh, suing out of fear. We're, if you're a soldier and you are a coward, they dishonorably discharge you and they court-martial you. Well, they don't put you on desk duty. The new officer needs to be, if he's scared, he needs to be taken off the force because he's mentally ill. And if he is uh, 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 scared, he needs to be taken off of desk duty. Will the new superintendent deal with that? Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. I ask that Douglas Bevel come forward to the podium going to read another comment. In addition to de-escalation and other training regarding mental health, are there ongoing mandatory trainings for police officers and non-civilians? If not, I believe this is, if this is implemented in policy and procedure, there would be a decrease in tragic events which lead to death, mistrust, loss of jobs, as well as personal livelihoods. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Uh, what I want to know is, why is everybody afraid of the police union? This is an organization that clearly works against the citizens of the city. The senator pointed out that they're, they're the ones behind the destruction of the records. They're protecting these cops. Why isn't anybody taking them on? When they can get on the camera and lie on a dead child, on the circumstance of his death, I think they're in breach of their contract. I think that contract needs to go. And I think the officers should demand a better union. Some of you are there in the back. 
Now, the Senate also uh, hit on something very important. That's the destruction of these records. These records are city property. They belong to the citizens. They're historical. They go all the way back to the Black Panther movement and, and John Burge. They also have exculpatory uh, evidence for people who've been falsely arrested. These records are extremely important, and the union, in a backdoor sneaky deal, is trying to destroy them, and they can't give a good reason why they should. Now, they want to destroy these records on March 15th, but they set the next hearing for March 21st. Okay, so can we do the math on this union? 30 seconds. Let's see what else I got to say here. Why are these officers who lied on, that, on their reports, not fired. We all saw the tape. They falsified their reports. This is what makes me feel like this is all a charade. Do we really care about our city? We want liars on our police force? Thank you, Mr. Bell. Y'all got work to do. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Can Mr. T. Can T. C. McLinn come forward as they come? I'm going to read another comment. Is it feasible to introduce an education program for citizens to become well versed in their constitutional rights when dealing with interactions with police officers? Is that an available option? Will the vetting process of the mental health of potential police officers be improved? And finally, what, if anything, can be done to filter the caliber of person allowed to become a police officer? Poignant remarks there. Moving on to you, Mr. T.C. McLean. T.C. McCoy. McLean. Good afternoon. I was a Chicago police officer for 28 and a half years. I took three, over 300 guns off the city of Chicago, never shot nobody. You can't teach a cat how to bark. What we need here tonight to let these people know that I know this and I'm an expert at this, what you need is you need people who look like you to work in your community. I'm one of the architects of community policing that started in the 15th district. You had a young man out south with a little knife get shot 16 times. You had another black man on the west side the day after Christmas had a baseball bat get shot six times. The next time we come here, we'll probably see a little boy with a popsicle stick get shot three times. What we need to do is we need to sit down and quit playing. We need to start getting very serious because we're having a meeting tonight. We're going to have a riot tomorrow. What we need to do is we got to quit playing about two minutes. We got to start playing about the rest of our life. These young people out here are not playing. We got to quit letting these officers get out here and write these frivolous reports and we come up here and we shuffle and we tell these police officers who we know that don't mean no good. Now there's 90% good police officers on the police department. There's 10% that need to be gone. Anytime you got six officers who lied and said that they heard the man say, put the knife down, and they wasn't even out on the street. You know that we sitting up here and we playing. Let's quit playing and let's get to business. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Can uh, Rebecca Raines come to the podium as she comes, going to read uh, another comment. If there is only 5% of cops that are bad, then how can they make 95% of the force participants look like they're misleading in their deeds? Just a comment there. Ms. Raines. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Raines, the criminal chair of the West Side Double NSAP um, branch, West Side branch of Chicago. And I wanted to address some solutions on race to start you off with some background information. I wanted you to know that we are not just talking about the officer to civilian racial instances, but also officer to officer. We're here to represent everyone. And um, to this, I'll just read a part from a, a report sent to the Department of Justice. Racial bias is also evident in IPRA's disparate treatment of officers accused of misconduct. 
IPRA is twice as likely to sustain an excessive force complaint against a black officer than a white one. C, um, Tramir Ali's black officer is twice as likely to be punished by CPD. Next, in a related trend, African American police officers are underrepresented on Chicago police departments, particularly at the supervisory and command levels. We are um, under the idea that if you have less racism within the department, you have better people going out. Things that we have at our regular jobs, such as ethics training, diversity training, all of these things that we see anytime we go to work need to also be a part of the police department training. The police officers might need a sabbatical. If you out there dealing with in crime all the time, you might need to take a break every couple of years or every couple of months to get back into a normal life, to come back to where you are. Professionals need to come in to look at that situation. We also wanted to say that black Chicagoans are most likely to be abused by police officers and less likely to be believed by IPRA. Black Chicagoans file 61% of all complaints against officers, but make up only 25% of sustained complaints, while white complaints are coming in at 21%, but 58% of them are sustained. We need to do something about the brutality, but we all having something about the racism will clear that up. And I thank you. Thank you very much for being cognizant for of the comment. time. Ma'am, there's one part of your, uh, your comments that I, do want to that I do want to respond to. Um, you made the comment that we should be employing some of the resources, techniques, training that we see in the private sector into the police department, and I just want you to know that's something that we have definitely talked about and we're looking at, particularly related to diversity bias training, unconscious bias training as well. And we've heard some rumors that there might even be a lot of veterans are hired to become police officers, which is great to hire veterans, but some of them might be suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, and they're out there in, that sh in those streets, and they're shooting and going crazy because of something that never really got healed from years before. Thank you for your comments. Thank you so much. Uh, Rennell Perry, you can come forward. I'm going to read a comment as they come. How can police improve drug usage and abuse behind neighborhood libraries, especially located in the West Garfield Park community? That's something that just is a local incident that needs to be addressed and I'm sure will be taken into consideration. Charmaine Ricketts. Good evening. Good evening, ma'am. I am Charmaine Riquette from Uncle Remus Chicken. Business has been on the west side for well over 50 years. And I am somewhat encouraged about uh, someone from workforce development being on the board. And that's where I want to direct my comment and question. So basically, workforce development is designed to help ex-offenders kind of be reintroduced to the workforce. And there are definitely some um, holes in that, but I only have two minutes. So I will ask uh, this question. Number one, I probably employ probably 75%. And my, my joke is you have, it's always a, it's a prerequisite. You have to be an ex-something, ex-drug addict, ex-prostitute, ex-gangbanger, or something to work for me. And I take pride in that because they need to be rebuilt. And I do believe that's one of the, the flaws in workforce development, they kind of help them work with the resume and then put them out and they haven't rebuilt them from the inside from being so broken from the brutality. Some things they brought upon themselves and a lot of, of innocent people are broken in, in the system and out of the system. So I'm asking you, uh, and I apologize, I don't know your name, I know you're the president of SAFER. I've actually worked with SAFER, hired people from SAFER and um, have built them up internally before they can work externally. So you're on the board, I am encouraged. Do you feel that it's going to make an impact? Because workforce and police work together, and to me there has been a disconnect because they're, they're still looked upon as ex-cons, ex whether they seconds. get a job. I've had my employee stopped and shown a paycheck because I do produce a paycheck, and they're still uh, treated misfairly. Um, from the police, so what do you feel your impact is? And I would like to know what your vision is for being on the board thank or the you. task force. Thank you so much, Ms. Rickett. Uh, well, okay. first of all, thank you so much for uh, what you're doing to hire people with the records. Um, uh, 3.9 million people in Illinois have criminal records. 
uh, there are only nine million adults in Illinois. So, you know, that gives you a sense of the magnitude uh, and in certain communities, um, more than half of the in, in adults in those communities have criminal records already. Um, I am hopeful that um, yeah, I'm going to be working with Randolph on the uh, police and community and engagement uh, working group. But I'm hopeful that in the recommendations, we could um, also recommend that there be another task force mm -hmm. initiated to really look at how we bring opportunity to the south and west side of the city. Um, you may have seen the report that came out from the University of Illinois Chicago that said 88% of black uh, youth 16 to 19 years old are unemployed. 85% of Hispanic youth are unemployed. Um, you know, 20 to 24 year olds, I think 59% of black uh, young, young adults are unemployed. Um, there's a certain amount of impact that we could have uh, if we would uh, get people trained and get them employed. And while we have so much unemployment, uh, there are a lot of job opportunities in our area. We just haven't found a way to connect people to those resources. Uh, this would help quite a bit with the crime, and it would take uh, a lot of idle people off the street who then wouldn't be interacting uh, with police if they were busy in school or in, on a job. So it's not directly the focus of this, this uh, task force, but I'm hoping we can sneak in a few Well, suggestions. that was my point, that it yeah. needs to be, because it works hand in hand, and the police need some further sensitivity as well as education as to that person. If they're going to continue to um, incarcerate them when they're stopped or when they're not doing anything, when they are trying, it just brings them backwards. So it's my hope that the police board as well as the task force really, really examine the workforce and the connectivity to the economic uh, survival of our race of our culture yeah. uh, with regard to police, because we don't need to be assassinated. Care to, when they get out of jail, is care to assassination because of, of their record. So Thank you, Thank you very much, be impactful. Thank you. I would like to have Gordon Walker uh, come forward to the podium. As he comes, I'm going to read another comment. Have the police patrol our community in a slower pace and stop running every light and stop sign. And secondly, make all department tactical officers reflect the communities that they serve. Uh, Gordon Walker, your name? You had called Rennell. Yes, Perry. I did. So, Earlier? Yes, you did. Okay, and so you are Miss, I think I have you here, Rennell. Rennell Perry. Okay. Very good. I'm Rennell Perry. I'm with the West Side NAACP. And my comments are going to be in reference to the Fraternal Order of Police contract. One of the things that we've done is we've actually read through the whole 163 pages, and we've specifically given you all a handout that identifies the sections within the FOP contract that are a specific concern. So I'm going to give you a quick example. Officer Van Dyke is probably not very worried right now, because according to the FOP contract, we can't look back beyond five years of his misconduct. So what that says, those 16 to 22 previous incidents that he had cannot be taken into consideration if they happened more than five years ago. The FOP contract says that if an officer is not allowed to preview all of the audio and visual information available to him prior to make a statement, that Rule 14 cannot be applied. Rule 14 says that if you lie, you get fired. And in most other police districts across the country, it's executed, not here in the city of Chicago, because the FOP contract does not allow it. Many people have spoken about the Local Records Act. The FOP actually went to Washington, D.C., according to their website, and met with the Department of Justice prior to them coming to Chicago. It has then been accelerated to try to get these records destroyed. How is it possible that a pattern and practices investigation can be done if there are no records? So what I want you to do in my last seconds. few seconds, mm -hmm. what I would like everybody to do, go to the website 
and read what the Chicago police rules and regulations say. Because the rules and regulations address all of the concerns that we're having here. The rules and regulations say the officers are to respect citizens. The problem that we have, and what I like when, when I finish my comment, I'd like for you to comment on what are we doing about the FOP contract, which is allowing bad systemic behavior within the Chicago Police Department, and I'd like for you to respond. Thank you. Let me, let me respond to um, several of your points. Um, we are specifically looking at the terms of all the collective bargaining agreements, not just the FOP contract. We recognize um, many of the points that you've made about how far back you can look at disciplinary records, and, and obviously we're, we're very aware of the uh, provision that requires that the officers uh, be given the, uh, the opportunity to view a videotape before they can be confronted with any allegations. We're looking at every aspect of the FOP contracts as well as the state statutes, general orders, um, to identify those things that we believe are an impediment to accountability. You'll hear this over and over again tonight and at every forum that we're at. We're very, very focused on the notion of accountability and transparency. I do, though, want to take issue with one point that you made, um, and that is um, that no officer ever gets held accountable on a Rule 14 violation. Not so. If you look at um, and I, I, I'll uh, give deference to my colleagues from the Chicago Police Board. If you look at the, the cases that have come before the police board, particularly during the time um, since I've been police board president, we have been presented with um, allegations of Rule 14 violations. And I can tell you, uh, with few exceptions, where the evidence is there, we find that the Rule 14 violation has been committed, and we vote to terminate the employment of the officer. We take that very, very seriously. My own personal view is um, there is no place in the Chicago Police Department for officers who lie, period, full stop. Um, and those charges are being brought. We take them very seriously. And if the evidence is there, we're going to rule accordingly. And to respond to that comment, I would draw your attention, and we provided a copy on page 7, section 6.2J, which states, an officer who is not allowed to review the video or audio evidence prior to giving a statement shall not be charged with the Rule 14 violation unless the officer has been presented with the video or audio evidence and given the opportunity to clarify it. There are a number of places, uh, section 6.1D, 6.1M, 6.2J, that speak to Rule 14. So again, I hope this task force, as the contract is coming due in 2017, right. will look at those issues because the FOP has a number of places within their contract that allows them to get around Rule 14. So we support your effort to fix that. We're just wanting to make sure everyone's aware of it, that the police are being given a pass, that we are not allowed as citizens. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Gordon Walker, if you can come to the podium as you come, another comment. Is there an effort to encourage police officers to attend these forums in order to build trust between the community and police, it's important to feel that officers themselves are dedicated to fixing these problems. Mr. Walden. Uh, yes, my name is Gordon Waldron. I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, Chicago Council of Lawyers. Uh, you, we have sir. several recommendations, and one of them is exactly the same point that the wo woman who spoke before me made. It has to do with the section of the collective bargaining agreement that allows police officers uh, who have made a statement about an incident which has been taped on video to review that video and amend or clarify their statement in order to be charged with uh, uh, falsifying a record. Uh, I, 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 Chicago teachers are not allowed the same uh, privilege, even though they are required to report on misconduct of students, and neither are traffic control aides or, or aviation security officers. We've looked at some of the other collective bargaining agreements. And most importantly, a citizen who uh, makes a statement to a police officer about an incident is not given the opportunity to clarify or amend his statement before being charged with perjury. Uh, there is no reason for the police to be given that special privilege, and the Chicago Council of Lawyers will be asking both uh, the, the city of Chicago and the uh, uh, police board 
to voluntarily agree to uh, repeal that uh, provision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I'd like for Don Davis to come to the podium as he comes, another comment, in an effort to familiarize and engage police officers with the communities they serve. Officers should be required to work, volunteer in a community-based program or organization, non-police related, for a few weeks every year or two as part of their work in the police department. I guess Mr. Davis uh, may have left, so I'm asking that Sarethia Reed come, or Reld. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sarethia Reed, as you, as you indicated. Good evening, ma'am. I'm sorry? I said good evening. Oh, okay. And I understand the objective of this whole task force is for accountability, transparency, and connection with the community. And I've had the ability of um, to living in two different neighborhoods in Chicago, and I can say there's sharp contrast in the experience that I've observed or experienced in terms of police interaction. Um, I think that in terms of con connecting with the community, there's something, there's a, a, a position called a beat officer, and in my um, area, people don't know who the beat officers are. So I'm not sure what that means to have beat officers. People are assigned to beats if no one knows who they are. People want the officers to get out of the cars and connect. Um, the, in any service delivery, um, there are best practices on how you um, respond to your client, your client base or wh whoever you're delivering service to. And so there are best practices and in any good um, service delivery model, there is a plan to have more transparency and accountability. So I'm interested in finding out if there's a plan to make available in 2016 to the public the means to track within a reasonable time frame, say 14 days, citizen police interaction in order to evaluate service metrics such as response time and action taken. Randolph, you want to take that? So you, th that point has been raised uh, um, a number of different times. Um, there's technology certainly that's available to track um, those kinds of interactions and, and um, have metrics to uh, measure the effectiveness of the service delivery, if you will. So that's something that we has been brought to our attention previously and is something we will be looking at um, as part of our work. So are, are you saying in 2016 that that will happen and that's made available to the public? So that, you can, so that you can track and if you had an interaction that what time did the police get there, you know, and, and compare it across communities. I can't, um, what I'm suggesting to you is that that's an issue that's been brought to our attention. We're aware of the technology um, and the programming that would allow that to happen. And it's cer certainly something that we're going to be considering as part of our recommendations in our report that we'll issue at the end of March. Now, the time frame on if the city is, chooses to adopt something like that, what the time frame would be for implementation, I can't sit here and tell you today, but we're aware that that is an issue. Um, and as I said, other people have brought that to our attention. So thank you, ma'am, for your comments. You know, one, before we go on, one thing I do want to remind folks, um, part of what we're going to be doing is issuing a report that will go to the mayor, obviously, the city council, and clearly the Department of Justice is also very much aware of the, of the work that we're doing. Um, and we will uh, certainly make our findings and our recommendations available specifically to the folks from the Civil Rights Division who are engaged in the pattern and practice investigation that's ongoing. Thank you. Former Second Ward Alderman Bob Fioretti, as he comes, another comment. Can the task force order forensic audits of police reports? Can the task force institute a policy similar to health insurance for police professional liability? The city pays a base officer, and at the same time, it says here that this would encourage uh, officers to be much more accountable for their actions. Alderman? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I do want to thank the panel, and I do want to thank the police board. About uh, 10 years ago, I did have a case, and it was, uh, uh, I, I helped a young man get out of jail, and then we sued the city, and we received the largest settlement ever. Um, 
The day we settled the case in the city council, we were highly criticized by the superintendent because we made recommendations on what to do because it was clearly a cover-up, it was a beating, and it was a young man who, sp who could barely read or write. Uh, I say this because when I got into the city council, I did look at the police board, and I was the author and the uh, uh, individual who pushed all the changes for transparency, accountability in the, uh, the new ordinance that you're acting under, including the cutback on, on benefits and on pay and on the stipends and making sure that you have to show up at meetings, which was not really the case before. Um, if we're going to have transparency and accountability in our communities, uh, you know, we, we need to be free when we call 911 that our young men or our young daughters and uh, sons don't get shot uh, on it. And, and it creates a problem that I see because six years ago I was criticized by my colleagues in the city council when I did call for a, and there was a police hiring going on at the time that I, I asked for uh, that we, our, our police force should reflect the diversity of our communities. And everybody either laughed or I was called up and said we can't do that. Well, we can do that if we really have the will and the way. The recommendations that you're hearing from the people here, while given, and maybe some of them are giving you five and ten, uh, five or five to ten different recommendations, really look to have an, a, a serious review. I mean, you, you should start with the CAPS meetings. I, I used to go to CAPS meetings throughout the second ward. This is not the second ward, but a couple of feet over uh, was. And I remember one weekend uh, in December of about two years ago, there was shooting at over at 26 and uh, 2600 uh, Adams. There was uh, a murder. There was a murder at uh, Jackson and Halstead, and there was a murder at 119th and Lafayette. Why do I say those? Because I was familiar seconds. with all of them. You know, we need to have the training. We need to make sure there's a judgment for the skill set for our police officers. But how do we get that? You know, police officers do have a problem too. Maybe they have a problem with their wife, their partner or something, and they come on the job and then they got to make a split second decision. Well, the sergeant's got to be much more sensitive. We're talking about sensitizing the police officer. Well, we need to sensitize the command staff so they understand who their people are, who are working for them, Thank you. and they can make the right decisions. Thank you, I'll, I'll see you shortly. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, well. for Thank your you, service. Sir. I'd like for Milton Johnson to, a matter of fact, Eric Russell. Eric Russell, if you can come forward first. Comment. Is it legal for the police to hold persons incognito at Holman Square or any place else without access to lawyers or family without being in charge? What is being done about this? That's something that one person, C. Uh, Wright, would like to at least have addressed. The question that they had, it says, is it legal for the police to hold persons incognito at home and square or any place else without access to lawyers or family without being charged. What is being done about this? Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of lawyers on this stage, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll weigh in. Obviously, anybody who's in custody um, who's been arrested has a right to a lawyer under the Constitution, and that's got to be upheld, period, full stop. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Russell? Hi, uh, good evening. My name is uh, Eric Russell um, with Mid uh, Midwest Life. I'm a uh, social justice advocate and community organizer. And over the last month, I've had the unevenable task of being the spokesperson for the Betty Jones family. Mm -hmm. uh, the Betty Jones family uh, did plan to attend tonight, but unfortunately, once again, the family was traumatized and the Chicago police are at the center of it. Uh, for those of you who do not, uh, who don't know, uh, Betty Jones is the 55-year-old grandmother uh, and mother of five and grandmother of nine who was shot down by simply opening her door. And I just want to say on behalf of the family and on behalf of my community is that Betty Jones did not deserve to die. Betty Jones didn't deserve to die because I want to say to my community more so than them, Therefore, the grace of God, go your mother or, I mo or my mother. Or my mother. Laquan. One minute. Okay, One minute. I'll wrap it up um, uh, real quick. I had to go pick up Betty Jones's grandson 
out of jail today on Madison. Betty Jones' grandson was taken into custody by the Chicago police for a skirmish on the basketball court. When I get there, is that the first thing that Betty Jones, Ladarius Jones, says out of his mouth, he said, Eric, I thought they were going to kill me. This is what kids think. And first, I, then I addressed the commander. I said, where's the youth officer? Why is a 12-year-old kid locked up with adults? This kid, has, this kid has pneumonia tonight. The police drug him out in his sweat clothes, in his shorts, in the storm, with his school books and his school bags in a garbage bag. If we're going to talk about respectful engagement, uh, if there's a such thing that's beyond racism, it seems like there is no respect for our humanity. Betty Jones was not even afforded respect in life. The Chicago Police Department, they lied to the medical examiner when they brought her body and they said that this was a not a police-involved shooting. It's bad enough that Betty Jones was gunned down by the very people who were sworn to protect her, but then her memory is disrespected when her body is brought to the medical examiner's office and you don't respect this lady and say, it is, it is not a police-involved shooting. I watch Betty Jones' children. Okay. They don't even come clean up the crime scene. I watch Betty Jones' children on their hands and knees in a house filled with bleach and ammonia only to be resaturated by their tears as they cry. The Chicago Police Department, the mayor, did not, they said it was an accident. Well, now, why Thank not you. clean up your accident? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it, Mr. Russell. Yeah. I'd like for Milton Johnson to come forward as he comes, comment. What is the power that your regulatory body will have to implement the necessary changes, and when is the date these changes will begin? Well, we will uh, make our recommendations to the Mayor and City Council uh, by March 31st, and it's our expectation uh, that those recommendations will be given due consideration and implemented. Um, as I said at the outset, um, we are uh, very serious and committed to the work that we're doing. Uh, we are not interested in having a nice report that gets bound um, and goes on a shelf. It's our expectation that what we do, what we hear from you, the findings that we make, and the recommendations that we make um, will be implemented. Um, so we're going to be very pragmatic and smart about the things that we uh, are asking, uh, the things that we're recommending. Uh, if there is a, if there's a additional resources that are, uh, are needed, if there are changes that need to be made to the collective bargaining agreement, a comment that many of you have uh, made tonight, we're going to identify specifically what needs to be done to implement the recommendations um, that we are making and the time frame that we believe in which they should be implemented. Well, I, again, I, I'm, I'm not involved in the litigation. I know specifically that the city opposed the destruction of those records. Um, if, if you followed it, the city is actually in opposition uh, to the FOP. I'm aware of what the arbitrator's decision is. We can get you some specific information about where that stands, but I'm sorry? I know that the arbitrator approved that, um, but the city is opposing the destruction of those records. The only thing that we ask is that let's try to follow the procedure and at least come up to the podium, all right? We'll make sure yes, that whatever you have, we'll stay here to make sure that that gets addressed. We just don't want ad hoc responses coming out when we have Mr. Johnson waiting. And he was, if you could. She said the city just needs to appeal the arbitrator's statement. Right, we have some because if he doesn't appeal it, then they, they can destroy it at any time. Okay. Understood. Thank you. I appreciate that. All we're trying to do here is just to maintain decorum and trying to maintain that those that have waited to speak have that opportunity before somebody else just comes out and takes it upon themselves to make a particular statement. Mr. Johnson, thank you for your patience. I see that we have one of our board members no, that speak. also wanted to say something. Go ahead. No, we're good. We're good? Go ahead, sir. Okay, Go ahead, thank sir. you so much. Um, first of all, thank you for this forum. Uh, my name is Milton Johnson. Um, 
I'm Director of Community Relations for Bobby E. Wright Comprehensive Behavioral Health Center. Uh, as the SIFSA made mention, um, there, there is no um, uh, um, mental health representation on the panel, and uh, I did invite Dr. Safir, uh, Rashad Safir, uh, CEO of Bobby E. Wright, to come out, but he was unable to make it due to uh, another engagement. Um, and also, uh, Reverend Floyd uh, made mention, Reverend James, made mention of the issue of police sensitivity training has been mentioned over and over again and has not been uh, really uh, taken serious. Uh, I heard Alderman Ferretti say that when he brought up that a community, the police should reflect the community, it wasn't taken serious. When I began to talk about there's a mental health issue, a mental health concern in these African American communities, it wasn't really taken serious and all of a sudden I began to hear mental health, mental health, mental health. Well, I want to say that I, I hear a lot about the CIT training and I believe that's a great thing to have. Uh, but we're not just talking about people that have been diagnosed with a mental illness. We have a community full of mentally ill seconds. people, undiagnosed mental illness, and I'm talking about statistics. We're talking about people that don't necessarily not like the police, but hate the police. We're talking about police officers who hate the people that they're policing. So we're talking about a serious mental health issue on both parts, and I believe that cultural competence and sensitivity training needs to be a part of the police academy. And Bobby E. Wright is uh, the oldest African-American community mental health center in the country. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. This is a follow-up uh, in terms of the question with regard to what type of changes will the police task force come up with. It was, when will we receive the specifics of the items of your overview that we are discussing tonight? Our, our report will be ready and delivered to the mayor, the city council, and more importantly to the public by March 31st. Okay. Specifics. I ask that Mr. Thomas Dorsey get ready to step to the podium as he comes forward. Comment. When police pay settlements for wrongful shootings, this money comes from citizens' tax dollars. Why can't this money come from the police pensions or their, or their $1.5 billion yearly budget? We spend $4 million a day in Chicago on policing, defund the police, and fund education. Yes. My name is Thomas Doesi. I'm a retired Illinois State Police Officer, 27 years. Good evening, sir. Prior to that, I was a Chicago police officer from 1968 to 73. And during that time, uh, we formed the Afro-American Patrolman League. Do anybody know about the Afro-American Patrolman League? All right, we formed it after the mayor then, Richard J. Dale, it came out after Martin Luther King was assassinated with Shoot to Kill. It was only 10 black policemen that started the league. We caught hell trying to get the lead. I worked out old film over the 10th district. Leroy Martin at that time was my sergeant. We finally got the lead going, and we sued the Chicago Police Department, won the suit in federal court against uh, promotion, hiring, and all the rest of it because the, the Chicago Police Department was discriminated against the black police officer, right? We decided, as Afro Patrolman's League, we decided that we were going to be nursemaid, if you will, for the other police officer. I worked out the 10th district, that's why I started 23rd and Damon. I was amazed to find out that there was more criminal element in the police department than on the street, okay? I got a reputation of don't work with Dorsey, he's clean. Okay? But what I'm trying to do now, I'm trying to revise the Afro-American Patrolman League. Pat Hill was the last president. Since then, 
is the legal dormant. I'm asking the black police officers with Chicago for the revised that Afro-American Patrolman's League, you are your brother keeper. And we need you to watch over whether he's black or white to make sure that they protect and serve. Thank you so much, Mr. Dodger. Well, you can go, real briefly, you can go to your uh, computer, check on the Afro-American Patrolman's League and print it out. Thank you, sir. We're asking that Ms. or Deonde Brown Whitfield come forward as they come forward to comment. A Chicago officer killed a young man with a taser two years ago. Officers are breaking the mics on their body as well as the dash cameras. How do body cams and tasers help? That's a comment there. And Deonde? Thank you. You must be really good at English. Deonde Brown Whitfield is my name. Um, I'm pleased to see some familiar faces, Elder Edie. Thank you. Just you walking in this room made me feel so much more comfortable. And um, Mr. Dixon, thank you. See, I've been volunteering for over 40 years. I'm not ashamed to say I'm 54 years old and a breast cancer survivor. I volunteered in Chicago public schools. I didn't live in Chicago all my life, so I'm different. People look at me. I am very unique. I'm outspoken. I look out for the rights of others. Um, there were a couple of concerns that I had, and I just addressed it in this manner. I am a victim of an incident, but I just received notification last week that it's not considered to be um, is not considered to be a police uh, crime because I didn't have the video to substantiate what happened to me. So what I would like to do is make some suggestions as far as ways to um, improve on um, solutions of police brutality in Chicago public schools. First of all, we have to understand that the adults that are placed in the positions of monitoring those children. It is their responsibility to serve and protect the children. I, as a retired nurse and volunteer, should not have to be the voice of Austin High School or anywhere else. If I come and I donate my time, energy, and money, I'm supposed to be protected. I found out that as volunteers, you really don't have many rights in Chicago Public Schools. So protect and serve the people that are trying to help the children. When you have people coming to the schools, I worked with architects and engineers for over three years where I have helped to redesign and keep Austin back to its beauty that it is. I don't feel comfortable walking in my own school. Uh, finally, just treat children and people as human beings. Most of the police officers are kind and nice and I feel comfortable with the police. But the one that injured me, no, I have no respect for him. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, as we ask for, I believe it's Ms. Carrie Bass, uh, if you can come forward. We have a comment. An officer is currently suing the family of the unarmed child that he killed. How is that possible? And why aren't officers organizing around this family? It's a thought. Okay. And uh, I guess Mr. Bass is no longer here, or Bass is no longer here. Moving on to Sharethea Reed. Sharethea, are you here? She's gone? Oh, she spoke. Well, I have a new card from her. That's why I'm putting that there. And Wayvon Davis. Wayvon Davis. Thanks for your patience, sir. cap on uh, citizens' uh, financial liability for police officers. I go like um, a two-year officer has zero leeway, financial leeway. If that officer gets involved in something that costs the city citizens money, he's automatically terminated. A uh, three-year officer maybe get 30,000, anything over 30,000, terminated, loss of pension. 
a maximum of 175,000 for police officers, whether it's five years, five years or 20 years on the force. Anything over 175,000 terminated, loss of pension. John Burge cost this city $80 million. I did, I did the math on it. If an entry level teacher is paid $50,000 a year, we could have hired 1,600 teachers for a year. From 2004 to currently, the Chicago police has cost this city $625 million in police brutality suits. But yet we closed 50 schools. 30 seconds. And you want to talk about job programs? I'm pretty sure $625 million could have financed summer jobs for the kids. And just so wrap it up, the records that they're talking about destroying belongs to us. Don't destroy them, and that's an order. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'd like for Mr. Romeric Mims to come forward. As he comes forward, another comment. Police at the 11th District do not watch police cameras and use them to fight crime. Can you investigate these issues? It is not only dash cam manipulation, it is police cameras in the 11th district. And now, Mr. Mims. I, I, I'm kind of confused. Why is it that you all are put in charge of doing something, but don't do it? I mean, what I'm saying is, is why y'all getting paid? See, I live in the worst neighborhoods it is. There is no such thing as a nice cop where I live. See all these people talking about 90% of them are good? You a liar. They need to quit lying. They need to quit lying, man. White cops are dirty. They are so dirty, it's ridiculous. Y'all don't understand what we go through in our neighborhoods. Y'all sitting up here playing these games with us. Seriously? See, and the black people are the worst because you know the truth. You know the truth. Say what it is. Cocaine and heroin is not made in America. Cocaine and heroin is not made in America. Why are we paying DEA? Why are we paying them? Why are Americans being abused behind something that's not made in this country? Show me somewhere where cocaine and heroin is made in this country. Aren't we paying DEA, ATF, all them people to keep it out? Why are we paying them? Why? It's all a joke to me. Nothing's being done. You call, you call, you call the war on drugs in the 80s. Evidently, the war, y'all have lost that war. In my neighborhood, y'all have lost that war. In your neighborhood, they, who neighborhood is invested with drugs? Raise your hand. So y'all have lost that war, and you see all the black people raising their hand? We so upset with y'all, it don't even make no sense. You know how many complaints I got filed with Emperor? 15 seconds. About 10 of them. I called Emperor the other day, they said, oh, nothing we can do. We said that to internal affairs. Do not send no police to my house. Investigate no police. Are you crazy? All right. They coming with guns, and they intimidating. We tired of y'all with this foolishness. This is foolishness. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. We're asking that Marianne Jackson come forward as she comes. Another comment. Okay. Do you have an organizational and do you have an industrial and organizational psychiatrist? or psychologist on your task force. Suggestion, the idea to have a picture and a small introduction of the police officers assigned to each beat on the CPD website is a good idea. This way we know who is patrolling our street and it makes us a greater connected neighborhood. A thought there. Ms. Jackson. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Judge Mary Ann Jackson and I am the calendar judge for uh, the 15th district, that's Austin. 
Every young person that gets arrested in Austin comes to my courtroom. But the thought occurred to me as I was sitting here this evening listening. We keep talking about sensitivity training, sensitivity training. There ought to be some common sense recommendations. First common sense recommendation. Police shouldn't be allowed to curse citizens. <laughs> Period. Now I know that police will say they curse us too. But the police are the professionals. They're supposed to be able to work through that. So that's a recommendation that can be made right away. Police can't call people niggers. Police can't tell people, go sit your black ass down. If you talk in terms of escalation, you say those things to people, it goes from zero to eight in about two seconds. And two more seconds and the lid is off the, the, the roof. It's just blown up. So just in terms of some common sense recommendations, police should not be able to curse citizens. I tell young people in my courtroom, if you make a mistake, fess up and admit it, that's the first step. <clears throat> if the police make a mistake, they need to fess up and admit it. 30 seconds. Right away. They should have been at Betty Jordan's house that night cleaning up the woman's blood. Her, her family shouldn't have had to do that. Woman on television yesterday, police then tore her house up. Turns out it was a mistake. There should have been somebody out there that night. That woman had three kids. There should have been somebody out there that night fixing her door. This, don't, this, this is not rocket science. Some common sense suggestions. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. At this time, we'd like to acknowledge and have him come forward with a question or comment, and that is Alderman Jason Irvin. Thank you. Um, the reasons uh, that, that we continue to come to these points are, are a bit troubling. Um, I don't know which iteration of a task force or accountability measure with the police department this is. Um, there have been studies, there have been additional items such as these to come back to the same solutions and make the same recommendations that have yet to be implemented. We know what the problem is and people are expressing those problems. I think the judge eloquently stated that their challenges and the point of mistrust between the community and the police department. Today I had a conversation uh, with someone that says, you know what, I was pulled over by a state trooper, and yet I was wrong. I didn't walk away from that interaction feeling less of a man, degraded, or in, in a poor spirit. We had our conversation, they gave me a ticket, and we moved on. You don't get that same conversation with interactions with the Chicago Police Department. We don't get those same interactions uh, with the tag teams and with the folks that are uh, been charged with coming out here to reduce crime by any means necessary. And when we work to reduce crime by any means necessary, that has caused us more harm, that has caused us more problems, it has caused us more financial settlements, it has caused us more lawsuits, and today we are here because it has totally eroded the trust that the community has in the police department. We will not fix problems without a serious conversation and admission by the police department in the city of Chicago that there is something inherently wrong in how we do business. And I'll use the example of water because water is in, yeah, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the news. When I, when I turn on the water faucet, I expect to have a glass of water that is clean, that meets all the standards that are out there. But when someone calls the Chicago Police Department, they don't have that same feeling. There is something wrong with a system 
that will allow the types of shenanigans that have existed close ranks on one another and expect us to just walk away and say it's okay. So I, I, I pray and I hope that after all of these conversations and studies and working groups and task forces that we come up not only with some common sense recommendations, but that we actually implement the recommendations because if we have another task force and do not implement anything, it will be an indictment on all of you all's character and, and, and from my reading, you all are solid upstanding people, but I would not allow my name or my position to be used to whitewash or cover up a situation. So I pray that we get some solid change out of this process. Thank you. Alderman, we really appreciate you being here tonight. Um, you've uh, laid out, I think, a compelling case for why this process needs to be different. Um, and we're committed to making that difference. You're 100% right. If we just do the same old thing over and over again and don't come up with real recommendations and real change and, frankly, lay bare some of the specific problems that have been endemic for quite a long time, we, have, we will have missed a real opportunity. Um, but I'm going to challenge you a little bit as well. You, we will be making our recommendations not only to the mayor, but to the Chicago City Council. And we will be laying out a plan and a blueprint for you and your colleagues uh, to address many of these issues. I look forward to working with you for impl implementing the recommendations that come out of the task force. Thank you very much. Here's a comment. Can you investigate why foot patrols in the 11th district rides down the street are being lessened uh, and that there are nine van officers instead of those people walking and engaging with the residents? That is a concern and a comment there. Let, let me just say this. We've had a number of comments um, over the course of the evening about issues and concerns related to the 11th district and some of the other districts on the, um, on the west side. We've heard those comments. We will be making sure that we bring them to attention of the commanders of the representative districts so that they can address these issues and concerns. And we also had to. Thank you for your comments, sir. Thank you. OK, uh, anybody else that submitted a card that wanted to speak hasn't had, I'm sorry, your name, sir? Okay, well, come on up, sir. If you did, unfortunately, it somehow got misplaced. Things like that happen in Chicago quite often. <laughs> How about an apology if it did happen? I would like to say uh, thank you for coming here. I hate to sound so pessimistic, but I don't believe you guys are going to change Jack. Y'all yeah, just here to listen to our complaints. This has been going on for over 50 years or more. There's nothing new. There's some BS. So I'm going to speak to you guys. If you want something to change, you have to change it. They're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. You got to get out and vote. You got to demonstrate. You got to hurt their pockets. Then they will listen to you. This former governor of Massachusetts, I happened to come in your great state while you were governor, and you did an awesome job. I wish to God you was here in Illinois. And no mean no disrespect to you guys. I've been living on this west side for 62 years. It's not new, and you guys know it. This is not new. Please, get some courage. Do your part. You could change things. Stop playing with people. These is lives being taken every day on the city, and you have eight arrests when over 100-something people getting killed. 
200 and something people getting shot this year? Why no one's going to jail? What's wrong is the police department is just as the worst gang Chicago ever had. Thank you. Thank you. Please do your job. Help the people. Stop getting the paycheck and go home and enjoy your nice living conditions. How about this? Could I just state one thing right now? I'm not getting paid, brother. I'm doing this to try to be of service to my community. Okay? I'm not getting paid. Okay? Back on. Can I reply? You can turn you the know, mic on. Well, they can turn it off. Okay, well, brother, I will apologize to you. Just but like to the I ones that to are getting you. paid, if it don't apply, let it fly. But to the ones that are getting paid, please do something. Please help us. Because if you don't come up with a solution, something's going to happen really bad in Chicago. And it's not going to be no more blacks tearing up their own neighborhood. They're not elevate. So Thank you, you sir. quit thinking Thank that you. we're going to tear up our right. own community again. And we have uh, another comment yeah, can here. I, can, can I make a comment? Uh, yeah, just, go ahead. Uh, sir, I appreciate your comments. Um, you know, uh, I don't get paid for doing this either. I mean, you know, um, I hesitated to join this task force because I, I didn't want to be part of something that would simply whitewash what was going on. Um, I, I'd rather not be part of anything like that. Um, the reality is we will make recommendations to the city council and to the mayor. It's up to them to act on those recommendations. But it's up to the community to put the pressure on the city council and the mayor to act. So I'm, 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 I'm hopeful that you all, when you see the recommendations, will see your concerns reflected and recommendations that get to the heart of the matter. But it's going to be up to you as citizens to put correct. the pressure on. You are absolutely okay. correct. I don't Thank know you, if anybody else up here is paid to we're, do this. We're all volunteers, so, well, so let's just be right. clear about that. We're all giving of our time because we care about our city. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We, we need to get Who's to other that? folks. Okay. We need to get to other folks, Thank sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. We need, we need to get to other folks, sir. See this from two perspectives. Not just a voter, but a game banger and a poli federal police officer. So I understand what's going on. It's no consequences. Thank you, sir. I have another comment here. Has the police department used statistics regarding whether or not requiring a two-year degree improved the department or made matters worse? The new officers have a degree, but no common sense. And finally, what about the internal racism within the department? Many black officers have been called the N-word by white officers. They are afraid themselves. Those are the comments we got to everybody that put in a card to speak, unless I have one more here. Okay. And uh, since she represents the West Side NAACP, we're going to have a closing comment there from Ms. Perry. Go ahead, Ms. Perry. Thank you. Um, I really just want to respond to Judge Jackson when she made her comment. And so with me, I have a copy of the police rules and regulations. And so it says here, Members of the Chicago Police Department are confronted daily with situations where firm control must be exercised to affect arrests and protect the public safety. Control is achieved through advice, persuasion, warnings, or the use of physical force. While the use of reasonable physical force may be necessary in situations which cannot be otherwise controlled, force may not be resorted to unless other reasonable alternatives have been exhausted or would clearly be ineffective under the particular circumstances involved. Officers are permitted to use whatever force is necessary 
and necessary to protect others from themselves. The use of excessive and unwarranted force or brutality will not be tolerated under any circumstances. So again, my, my closing comment is we appreciate you coming out. I just implore everyone here, go look at the rules and regulations. The problems that Judge Jackson spoken to, it, it's here. The answer is here. We just have to execute what we have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Any closing comments? Well, uh, we've had, a, I think, a very good discussion tonight. We thank you all for coming out and hanging with us. Uh, this is the first of four community forums that we'll be having across the city. Uh, the next one is February 11th um, at the South Shore Country Club. If you didn't get your comment um, addressed tonight, um, there are a number of different ways in which you can communicate with us, come to another forum, go to our website, you can send us an email, you can write us a letter, uh, or you can call. But again, it's very, very important for us to hear your voices, uh, hear the voices of your, your friends, neighbors, and relatives. This is a serious issue that all Chicagoans um, need to be heard um, from, and we appreciate you coming out tonight. Thank you very much. And once again, on behalf of Chairman Lightfoot, and all of the task force members, we want to thank you and emphasize that your input is crucial to help develop pragmatic and transparent recommendations to the Chicago Police or for the reform of the Chicago Police Department. As she had mentioned, this is important information. It's also included in the brochure. Our website is chicagopatf.org. You can email your comments to comments at chicagopatf.org or you can mail us at the Task Force on Police Accountability. That P.O. Box is 6289 Chicago, Illinois, with a zip code of 60606. You can follow us uh, on social media. Tweet us at chicagopat.org, or we have a Facebook page at chicagopatf.org. As Chairman Lightfoot has mentioned, this is our inaugural task force meeting. Our next one will be February 11th at the South Shore Cultural Center. Then on February 23rd, the task force will be in Pilsen at the Benito Juarez Community Academy. And the last forum will take place on the 25th at Sullivan High School in Rogers Park on the north side. All of them will be held from the same time as today, 6 to 9 p.m. Please give yourselves a round of applause for the way that you address the issues. We are truly appreciative of everybody coming out. My name is Daryl Denard. Thank you once again for your participation.